Well, it's preaching time. Take your Bibles, turn with me, please. The second book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Hope you'll be back tonight at 5 o'clock. We are doing a series on Sunday night um, called Shaping the Next Generation. You don't want to miss that. And uh, I hope that you'll be back this evening as we dive back into that uh, wonderful, wonderful subject of making sure that those younger ones around us are prepared for life and, and uh, prepared to carry the torch, amen. So don't miss that tonight at five o'clock. But right now we're in 2 Timothy 4. Stand with me please as we read a very familiar passage of scripture. 2 Timothy chapter four, verse number one. If you're there, say amen. amen. The Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned into fables, and watch thou in all things, and endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Uh, in verse number two, we see the word preach. In verse number three, we see the word time. I want to preach this morning on this thought. It's preaching time, amen. It's preaching time. Lord, help us now as we explore the scriptures, stir our hearts. May God's people be fed, encouraged, challenged. May the lost be saved. May the backslider, sliders, Lord, be reclaimed and come back to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Almost every single time I mount this pulpit, I say, it's preaching time. I don't know if, you, if I ever told you where I got that from, but I got that from my dear friend, Brother Sammy Allen. If I heard him say it once, I heard him say it a hundred times and passed away last Sunday evening at 10.06, got the word that he had gone on home to be with the Lord. He had a lot of sayings. He had a lot of Brother Sammy Allen-isms uh, that were unique to his vocabulary. If you ever heard him preach more than a few times, you heard him say uh, several things and preaching time was one of them, was preaching time. Another thing you'd always say, if you ever hear that, I've, that I'm dead, he said, don't you believe a word of it? He said, I'll be more alive than I've ever been before. If I heard him say that once, I heard him say that a hundred times, amen. And he's shouting on the streets of glory this morning. Many of you may not know this, but when he preached here at our church on June the 14th, that was the last time he ever preached. I had a feeling that was the last time he preached off, away from home. Uh, but when I, I began to ask around because I wanted to make sure and I talked to several people, he got back home from here, got sick, never preached again. He preached 60 something years and the last time he preached was right there in that chair. I got to sit right beside him and hold his hand while he preached. What a tremendous, tremendous honor. Dr. Sa Dr. Seitler, Harold Seitler, some of y'all remember that name. He preached here uh, about a month before he died. This was the last place away from home that Dr. Harold Seitler ever preached. And then, of course, this was the last place Brother Sammy ever preached. Brother Replogal said, Brother Shit said, I don't ever want to preach in that pulpit again. <laughs> I said, if your wife ever calls me and asks me to book you for a meeting, I'm going to know y'all are having marital problems. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but no, what a great honor it was to have Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Sammy Allen here. But I heard him say that all of my life. It's preaching time. And uh, I just uh, thought this morning uh, how appropriate it would be in the day and age in which we live, maybe just come back and preach about this a little bit, amen? And uh, by the way, there's a difference in preaching and preaching. Yeah. Don't ask me to give you the, di the difference. I can't tell you, I can't verbalize it, but there's just a difference in preaching and preaching, amen? I grew up where there was a whole lot of preaching and praying and singing and shouting and a giving, amen? And I don't go hunting. I go hunting. There's a difference. I, I don't go fishing. I don't know how. I go fishing. Amen. It's just a difference. Don't ask me to explain it. But I grew up where preaching was a vital part of my life. Amen. I mean, hey, I love singing. You know, our family sings. We gather around the piano and sing all the time. I love to sing. I joke with people. I say, I'd rather eat than sing when I'm hungry. I love to sing, but there's nothing. Y'all didn't even get that. That's a good joke right there. But nothing fires me up any more than preaching and getting, getting, under the, getting under the spout where the glory comes out, amen, and, 
And uh, I just wanted this morning, by way of introduction, look at a couple of things in our passage here this morning. I could have used a number of texts, but there's a couple of things I want to point out. Well, Lord really showed me some things that I've never seen before in this particular passage of scripture. By way of introduction, I want you to notice, first of all, the directive. We see the directive. Paul said in verse number one, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom preach the word. That was a directive that Paul the apostle, as he's nearing the end of his life, he's literally, can I say it, on his deathbed, uh, so to speak. As you get to verse number six and seven and eight, Paul is about to die. He's about to be martyred. He's nearing the end of his ministry. His very fruitful, very uh, amazing a miraculous ministry, he's nearing the end and he's writing young Timothy and he's giving him a directive. That word charge, it means to earnestly and solemnly confirm. I mean, Paul, as he's talking to young Timothy through this letter, it's almost like he's got him by his face and he's looking him in his eyes and he's saying, I'm telling you right now, if you don't do anything, I want you to preach. He's directing him, he's charging him. I feel that same urgency from the Apostle Paul this morning. As I read these verses yesterday, as I studied them early this morning, I still feel, I feel like Apostle Paul's got my face in his hands and he's looking at me and my God-given eyeball saying, hey boy, I want you to preach the word of God. We see the directive. We see the doctrine in verse number three. The time will come. Well, they will not endure sound doctrine. I heard people say it before. They, well, 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 the problem is people today just don't like doctrine. No, they don't like sound doctrine. <laughs> They're flocking to false doctrine. It's not doctrine they got a problem with. It's sound doctrine they got a problem with him. Paul is telling him the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine and one of the responsibilities of the preacher, the man of God, is to stand up and open this Bible and to rightly divide the word of truth and preach sound biblical doctrine. I could preach for two months on that, but I'm gonna go to point number three. We see in verse number three, we see the departure. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They just won't put up with it anymore. They tolerated it for a while. But it gets to the place to where they can't tolerate it anymore. They, they can't endure it. You ever been somewhere and you had to endure? Hmm. I've been to some places where I just couldn't wait to get out. Amen. He said they could not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Look at verse four, and they shall turn away. We're talking about the departure. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I don't know how many times I've preached these verses. I don't know how many times I have preached this passage of scripture, some of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I go back and read them sometimes, it just fires me up. But I don't think I ever noticed what I noticed yesterday for the first time. Something very disturbing about this departure in verse number four. The Bible says they shall turn away their ears. That's active. And shall be turned. That's passive, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not an English scholar, so if I'm getting this wrong, just nod your head and say amen. It'll make me feel better. But there's a difference in the way it's worded in verse number four. They shall turn away and shall be turned. Huh? In other words, their turning away their ears was voluntary, but they shall be turned is involuntary. Walking away from sound doctrine was their choice, but being turned to fables and lies and deceit was a result of their choice that they did not anticipate. Because they rejected light, God sent them darkness. Because they refused truth, God sent them lies and deceit. Somebody still with me? The Bible says they shall turn away their ears. It doesn't say, and shall turn their ears unto fables. They shall be turned. There's a difference in turning your head on uh, because you want to and somebody turning your head because they want you to. And we see this departure begins to compound. Here's what, here's what David said in Psalm 81, verse 10. God said, I'm the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. 
but my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lusts, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. God said, I told them, open your mouth, and I'm gonna fill it. But they didn't want what he had for them, and so he let them be turned to their own lusts. Amen. And that's exactly where we're at in 2020. People have turned their ears away from the truth. They've walked away from sound doctrine. They've walked away from truth. And as a result of that, God has let the veil fall down over their eyes and they're believing lies. They're being deceived and they're, they're buying into fables. Fables. I can't imagine going to church and listening to fables. As, as a kid growing up, I never was too, too big about fables. I enjoyed reading history. They're trying to do away with history, by the way. I listened, I listened yesterday to a video in, in complete horror. Some elected official is now trying to get it passed where they don't teach history in the schools anymore. Don't get me started. But I enjoyed reading stories that were true. I enjoyed reading biographies and autobiographies. I enjoyed reading war stories. And I, I was a history buff from the time I was little. I was fascinated by things that happened. I wasn't too crazy about spending a lot of time with make-believe. There's a time and place for it. But there's a lot of people sitting in places right now that we call church, I'm using that word loosely, sitting in churches right now, listening to, can I use that word loosely, preachers right now, preaching, can I use the word loosely, messages that's really nothing but fables. And they're eating it up. They're eating it up, you won't know why. At some point, they turn their ears away from the truth and they have now been turned unto fables. You ever get a taste for fables, you won't want the truth anymore. The Bible says in Psalm 106, verse 13, they soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel and he gave them their request but sent leanness unto their soul. Heard a preacher years ago preach a message from that passage. The title of his message was they got what they asked for and lost what they had. There's a lot of people today getting what they're asking for and losing what they have. Is everybody still with me? Well, that's just a little something God showed me as I read these verses again and again yesterday and this morning by way of introduction. But I want to say this morning, it's preaching time. It's preaching time. It's always been preaching time, by the way. I mean, as I, was, as I was researching and studying the Bible, just looking at the places where you see the word preach and preacher and preaching, I realize there's always been preaching time, but we need it now more than we've ever needed it before. Let me give you a few points here. Write these down. Number one, what to preach. We know it's preaching time. What are we supposed to preach? Paul told Timothy in verse number two exactly what to preach. Amen. Preach the word. Is that what your Bible says? Can I say it this morning? The only hope that we have for America, the only hope for this world, the only hope for civilization is the word of God, the preaching of the word of God. If there's any hope whatsoever. You say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's parts of it. There's parts of it maybe, but parts of it maybe not. Here's what Paul said in Acts chapter number 20. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul said, I didn't, when I came to you, I didn't pick and I didn't pick and choose. I didn't pick all the good parts and the fun parts and the exciting parts and the warm and fuzzy parts and leave out the rest of it so I gave it all to you. The meat, the taters, the gravy, the green beans, the Brussels sprouts. Come on now. And the banana pudding. Hallelujah. There's a little bit of all of it in there. Callie works up here at Joanna's Cafe and they make those shakes and all those drinks and all that fancy stuff. And I said, how do y'all make them? I said, how do you, what all do you put in there? She says, well, we put peaches or we put, we put yogurt and we put ice and we put milk and we put, we put spinach. I said, spinach? She said, well, you can't taste it, but it, it makes it healthy. I thought, I wish there was some way I could stick spinach in the middle of a, of a, of a peach milkshake. Somehow or another, when I preach spinach, it's just pure spinach. Amen. And, and it ain't too many Popeyes anymore. Can I get a witness? Bring it on, preacher. Bring on the spinach. 
I know it don't taste good, and I know that there's not a whole lot of ways you can doctor it up, but it'll make me strong. It'll help me. Bring it on, preacher. Ain't too many Popeyes. Boy, I'd like to have a church full of Popeyes, amen. I said, I got a spinach message. They're like, bring it on, preacher. I'm gonna squeeze that can. I'm gonna eat every bite of it. And watch my big old spiritual muscles pop up where you can see my anchor tattoo from a mile off. <laughs> preach the word, he said, preach the word. And we got a lot of stuff being preached that's not Bible. You watch people on TV, they're sitting out there and they got their notebooks and their pens and they're just, and they're just lapping it up and, 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 and Joyce Myers will say something and you go, what in the world? And they're going, oh, that's wonderful. And they'll start writing it down. I believe, honestly, I believe if she got up on a Sunday and said, tomorrow, church, tomorrow's Monday. They go, oh, that's so good. Tomorrow's Monday. I can write that down. What happened? People got used to preaching other things besides the Bible. And it's time to preach the word of God. Amen. Get back to the Bible. Get back to the precepts of the word of God. It's preaching time. What do we preach? We preach the Bible. That's why I tell you, get your Bibles out. Open your Bible. Bring your Bible to church. Coming to church, coming to this church without a Bible is like going to a smorgasbord without a fork. You can do it, but it's going to get messy. Amen. Bring your Bible. We preach the Bible. Somebody says something to me, they say, why don't you put the Bible verses up on the screen? I said, because I like for people to look at it in their Bible. Yeah. I'm not against it. If you go somewhere and they put the Bible verse on the screen, that's fine. But there's something to me about seeing it in my Bible. Yeah. Amen. I mean, that guy, with all due respect, those guys in the sound booth, they ain't always the sharpest knife in the drawer. They might get it wrong. That Bible don't ever get it wrong. Can I get a witness? They might throw up the wrong verse or throw up the wrong version of a verse that leaves out a key word. Hey, I want you to see it in your Bible right here that the Bible still is the Bible. It's still the word of God. Amen. Preach the word. Number two, write this down. Not only what to preach, but when to preach. When? Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number four, he said, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. I looked it up in the Greek. That word for season literally has a couple different words that you could look at and go with. Several ways you could interpret what Paul is saying here, be instant in season. And out of season, you could interpret literally as, as you would seasons, for, as in a farming or a planting type of a, of a way. And I mean, you could go with that. I mean, that's not what it's talking about, but you, if you say, man, that's talking about in season, out of season, it'll still work. Because I mean, there's times in the, I mean, Ecclesiastes says there's a time to reap and there's a time to sow. There's not, a, there's not always the right time to sow seed in the field. But there's never a wrong time to preach. But really, they ain't what he's talking about. He's talking about the word in season literally means to be convenient. That's what it means. You can look it up when you get home. Preach when it's convenient. Preach when it's not convenient. That's pretty much 24-7. When do we need, when, when's it preaching time? Anytime, all the time. Well, I'm not in the mood for preaching. Don't make no never mind. Hey, man, it's still preaching time. Well, I'm not ready. I'm, my heart's not ready. I'm not ready. It's preaching time whether you're ready or not, amen. We used to play that ready or not. Here I come, amen. And I'm telling you this morning, it's preaching time whether it's convenient or whether it's not convenient. It's becoming increasingly, increasingly more inconvenient to preach. There are times when it's more convenient to preach than other times. Apostle Paul knew that, by the way. Oh, don't think that Paul didn't know what he was talking about here. Apostle Paul, obviously, it was more convenient for him to preach in Acts chapter 20, verse number nine, when he was up in that third loft preaching until midnight, surrounded by a bunch of hungry Christians that was loving it. It was probably more convenient than it was preaching on Mars Hill in Acts 17 when he was surrounded by skeptics and mockers. But he preached in season and out of season. And he told Timothy, preach whether they like it, preach it whether they don't like it. Let me, let me give you an example. Something the Lord showed me early this morning. Never seen this like this before. In 2 Peter chapter number two, in verse number five, I'm talking about somebody knows what it means to preach out of season. Preaching in season is fun. 
I get to do that just about every time I get up here. It's always in season at Calvary Baptist Church. And I thank you for that. But I've preached at a few places where it was out of season. They didn't tell me that until I got up there. They kind of hung me out to drive. I got up there and figured out real quick that it's not going to be convenient to preach here today. I'd rather conducted a funeral for an atheist, I believe, than preached in that place. And you just preach anyway. But I want to talk about somebody that knows what it's like to preach when it's not convenient. I thought about Noah. You ready for this? Watch this right here. 2 Peter 2, 5. The Bible says, Spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. Not once does the Bible call Noah a carpenter. And he was a carpenter. Not once does God call him a builder. And he was a builder and a good one. Not once was God, Noah called an architect or an engineer or a fabricator or a woodcutter or a tree surgeon or a craftsman or a, a harvester or a quartermaster or a zookeeper. He was called a preacher. <laughs> you say, preacher, what do you say? I'm saying he preached while he was cutting down trees. Come on now. He was preaching while he was hewing Beams. He preached while he was a cutting planks. He preached while he was slopping pitch. He preached while he was harvesting grain. He preached while he was wrangling giraffes. It didn't make no difference what he was doing. He was preaching. And that was about as an inconvenient time to preach as there's ever been. The world was so ungodly at that time that God decided to destroy it. world was so wicked, God said, I'm going to kill them all. Yes, you think it's bad now? It was worse then. You say, ain't no way it could have been. Sure it was. The, heart, the, the thoughts and the, and, the, and, the, and the hearts was only evil continually. The imaginations were only evil continually. Eight. Eight. Eight was all got on that ark. I believe we got more than that here this morning. Preacher, it ain't never been this hard to preach. You should say that to Noah. Try to preach to an ungodly civilization while you're cutting down trees, skinning bark off of logs, and trying to wrangle hippopotamuses and giraffes and elephants. Stay with me now. Oh, we only did it for 120 years. Oh, and none of them listened. Not one ever walked the aisle. Not, mm, not one time, Brother Sasser, in 120 years of preaching, did anybody ever walk over there with tears in their face, run down their face saying, could you stop what you're doing a minute? Could you tell me how, what I need to do to get right with God? Not once did he get to do that. God called him a preacher. <laughs> preaching time, in season and out of season. Is everybody still with me? Preacher, I know it's hard for you to preach in 2020. Oh, it ain't hard as you think it is. It's a lot easier than it was back then for Noah, preacher of righteousness. Paul told Timothy, preach where they like it, preach where they don't like it. Preach when they listen, preach when they get up mad, walk out. I used to confront people when they did that. I don't do it no more. I was taught to do that. It's kind of rude, but I used to do it. I'd say, hey, the people get up in the middle of my preaching, get their Bible up. They'd, I'd say, hey, are you mad? I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't even noticed that they were leaving. It used to bother me. People get up and leave mad. Yeah. Now I'm just glad they came to start with. I'm glad they stay as long as they do. Amen. Yeah. Could you imagine being Noah preaching? Could you imagine? 120 years. He got his family in though, didn't he? He's got to count for something. Write this down, number three. I'm hurrying. I'm hurrying. Why to preach? Why? Why to preach? It's preaching time. Why should we have so much preaching? Three sub points. Quickly write these down. Paul wanted Timothy to preach because of the imminent appearing Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in verse number one. Jesus is coming. Now Paul told Timothy, Jesus is coming. He's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That was a motivation for Timothy to preach. That was almost 2,000 years ago. He's still coming. He's still coming. 
and I want to be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. When he comes back, I want him to find me still preaching. Amen, he's coming. He wanted to preach because of the imminent appearing. He wanted him to preach, verse 3 and 4, because of the imminent apostasy. The time will come, Paul said, for the time. Preach the word, verse 2, for the time will come. Here's a reason why you need to preach because the time is coming when they're not gonna listen to it anymore. Can I tell you something, church? That time Paul was talking about, it's here. It's now. We're here, absolutely. And I've heard it preached my whole life. All my life. Sister, Sister Jimmy Lou Allen told me, she told me Friday, she said, Brother Shifter, she's sitting in the wheelchair. She said, Brother Shifter, Brother Stacy, she said, Sammy wouldn't make funeral arrangements. Never would make funeral arrangements because he just knew for sure he was going to be here when Jesus came back. Always looking for Jesus to come back. And I remember Brother Sammy preaching in the 70s. Jesus is coming. He's coming. I'm like, do a little impersonation up here. Hey, friend, he's coming. Hey, he's coming. Is everybody listening? It's a serious business. Serious business. He's coming like a thief in the night. Hey, look up in here. Serious business. Hey, 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 he's coming. If I heard him say it once, I heard him say it a thousand times as a little boy, Jesus is coming. Paul told Timothy, preach. He's coming. And the day will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Well, we're here. If there's ever been a need for sound doctrine, it's now. Preach because of the imminent appearing. Preach because of the imminent apostasy. Verse 5, preach because of the imminent afflictions. He said to him in verse number 5, watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Paul knew a thing or two about suffering. He knew a thing or two about the afflictions that are associated with the ministry. And he told Timothy, the afflictions are going to come. You need to preach the word and be ready to endure afflictions. Couldn't help but notice in John 21, Jesus was talking to Peter. And he looked at Peter three times and said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, which is what preaching is, feeding the sheep. And here's what he said in the same context of feed my sheep. Here's what he said in John 21. You can look at it when you get home. Chapter uh, 21 of the book of John, uh, verse number 17, he said at the third time, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto them, follow me. Peter, Jesus looked at Peter and said, feed my sheep three times. Feed my sheep because the day's coming when they're gonna take you where you don't wanna go and they're gonna bind your hands. He was talking about the martyr's death that Peter would face. What was Jesus saying? You better preach while you can because the day's gonna come when you're not gonna be able to anymore. Never in my life have I had this hanging over my head like it is right now, Brother Leader, that the days are numbered that I'm gonna be able to preach the word of God on this side of the prison bars. Now, I ain't never really had a desire to start a prison ministry from the inside. But that's going to probably happen before it's over with. We're already in a fight with Baltimore County now. They're trying to, trying to find us just for coming to church. There's churches in California right now. There's a judge in California right now. Listen to what I'm telling you. That just put a restraining order on that church, on that pastor, and they put a restraining order on John Doe one through a thousand. And I ain't talking about just finding the pastor. I'm talking about finding anybody that shows up in there to have church in California. I'm not making this up. I'm talking a restraining order against the church. John Doe, one through a thousand. 
You won't believe phone calls and letters I'm getting, by the way, people all over the country praying for our church. For those of you that didn't get the update, we lost our court case. It took them seven weeks to tell us what we already knew they were going to do. I think they were waiting for the rapture to take place so they wouldn't have to fool with us. <laughs> the judge says, I don't have the jurisdiction. It's outside of my purview to deal with constitutional issues. And it says in the paper, I ought, to, I ought to make it available to you so you can read it and your stomach can turn like mine did. It's not about the fine. And you slap on the wrist. We're going to slap y'all on the wrist over there so y'all know who's boss. It's not about the fine. We just want you to know when we tell you to do something, you got to do it. And when we tell you not to do something, you can't do it. It's outside of our purview, the Constitution. Forget the Constitution. I'm grateful for it. But I got something way more powerful than the Constitution right here. It's called the Word of God. I'm telling you, the day's going to come when you're going to have to dig up a cassette tape of me preaching because it ain't going to be online. They'll purge me. Mark it down. I started a podcast the other day. People, why you start a podcast? Ain't you got enough irons in the fire? I got so many irons in the fire, I ain't got room in the, in the fire for my ironing board. But I know the day's coming when I'm going to need every possible platform I can find to get the gospel out and get the word out because they're going to shut me down. I'm going to preach while I can. Amen. And I'm grateful here. Nobody ever rushes me. I rush myself. I say, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. And y'all don't, don't ever rush me. Because I could preach for three hours straight with y'all sitting out there eating it up. I, I'm telling you, I love preaching in this place. But I know, I, won't, I, won't, I, I, I doubt very seriously, I'll still be preaching behind a pulpit. Jesus tears is coming when I'm in my 70s. I'm going to be 48 years old in October. If I make it to 50, it'd be a miracle. They'll have me locked up. They don't like that book right there. And they don't like anybody that'll preach that book. And that's the only thing I know to preach is this book right here. It's all I got. And I'm telling you, he said, hey, you better go ahead and get ready for the afflictions. That was 2,000 years ago. Here's a man writing from prison about to get his head cut off. He knows what he's talking about. Where are we at? Point number, where are we at? I lost my place up here. You need to go get lunch and come back. We'll still be here. <laughs> Heard about this guy got up in the middle of the message and left, was gone for a while, and he came back and sat down. The preacher asked him after church, he said, where'd you go in the middle of the message? He said, I went to get a haircut. <laughs> he said, why didn't you get one for church? He said, I didn't need one. <laughs> now that's a long message right there. <laughs> Number four, write this down. I ain't gonna do that to you. Write this down, Number four. How to preach. I'm glad the Bible tells you not only what to preach and when to preach, but it tells you how to preach. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 58, verse number one. The Bible says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Preach it while you preach so loud. God told me to. You say, it's too loud. Well, bring some toilet paper and stick it in your ears. I gotta preach loud. The Bible said, spare not. Don't hold back. Zane and I were yesterday was watching a little clean cowboy western movie. And uh, they was trying to teach a bunch, of, a bunch of cowboys trying to teach his city slicker, this 17-year-old boy, spoiled brat, trying to teach him how to do something. And he sat around and played his video game until his batteries died. And then finally he said, is there anything I can do to help? And they're fixing to go wrangle these cows. And he said, uh, can you holler? <laughs> can you holler? He said, yeah, they said, holler. He said, hey, and they all laughed. They all just started laughing. They put him on a horse, gave him a, gave him a, gave him a rope, and they said, I want you to sit right here on this horse, and when these cows come down through here, he said, I want you to holler. He's sitting over there. He's got his ball cap turned around backwards, you know. Got his track pants on, got his Reeboks on. He, I mean, he's just, hey, he's as out of place as they get. He sat up on that horse, and here come those big old long horns down through the trees, and he went, whoo, whoo. And the guy on the other side's got his hat off. He's going, yeah, whoo. He said, holler at him. He went, whoo, whoo. And finally, they was coming at him. He went, whoo, whoo. He said, there you go. That's hollering right there. That's how you do it. 
preacher, why you get so loud? You ought to be up on this side and try to see all these long horns running every which way. I'm trying to get you lined out, hallelujah. Yeah! I was researching old George Whitfield. George Whitfield could preach out in the middle of a field. And I, and now, Benjamin Franklin heard stories about George Whitfield and the crowds he drew when he was preaching in England. He said, I don't believe it, it's tall tales until he came over to the United States and started preaching. I read it this morning. Benjamin Franklin started walking, started walking away from George Whitfield. He said he could still hear him distinctly at 500 feet, every word. He would preach in an open field to 20,000 people, Stan. 20,000 people without a PA system. Now, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm pretty sure that he wasn't preaching like this. Today, it's such a blessing to have God's people. I just had to do that little sissy lisp, didn't I? No, man. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that to y'all. You won't never see me the same again. I thought about Acts 26. Paul's witnessing, preaching, testifying before Festus. I was reading it this morning in Acts 26, verse 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Why do you reckon Festus had to use a loud voice to interrupt Paul? I'm guessing Paul was probably cutting loose. He was preaching so loud. He was so animated. Festus shook his head and said, man, you need to pull yourself together. You've lost your mind, Paul. You're mad. Paul said, I'm not mad. I hadn't lost my mind. I'm just telling you right now, I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Passionate preaching, fiery preaching, loud preaching. You know why preachers need to preach loud? To cut through all the television people's been watching all week cut through all the social media, cut through all the junk that they've been filling their hearts and minds with. Need to come to church and need God to use the man of God's voice to thunder and shake and wake the people of God. I'm not making apologies for preaching loud. You're welcome to sit in the platform. You're welcome to sit in the, in the parking lot if it gets too loud. Somebody said, man, you preach too loud. I said, I can't help it. I do everything loud. Can't help it. Number five, this is my best point right here. Write this down. Who to preach? It's preaching time. Who? Who to preach? You know the answer to that. There's only one. We should magnify the Lord Jesus Christ with the preaching. Peter and the other apostles in Acts chapter number five, verse 41 and 42, departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. He's worthy. Philip, in Acts chapter number 8, verse 35, opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, preached unto him Jesus. Peter, I mean Philip, out of Isaiah 53, preached Jesus. What about that? Acts 17, 18. Certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. Some said, what will this babbler say? Others said, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus. Sweetest name I know, Jesus Christ. He's worthy. He should be preached all over the world to every creature, every man, woman, boy, and girl on this planet needs to hear a God-called preacher preach about Jesus. Preach Jesus unto them. I'm thankful here at Calvary Baptist Church, we preach Jesus. Every message ought to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. If they're not saved, it ought to point them to salvation. If they are saved, it ought to point them to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. Every message. I can't remember who it was. If I thought about it for two minutes, I'd remember. Somebody said it, some well-known, might have been Charles Spurgeon. Somebody said something like this. No matter where you preach in that Bible, when you get done, you ought to be pointing toward Calvary. That's a great, great thought. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. He's coming back. He's coming back. Brother Sam used to say it all the time. We're going out of here like Superman and coming back like the Lone Ranger. <laughs> On white horses. He's coming. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, 
Would you get saved before you leave? It'd be our greatest honor to take a Bible, sit down next to you and show you how you could know for sure you're going to heaven. When you die, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. There's no reason whatsoever for you to go to hell. Jesus paid your sin debt, paid your penalty on Calvary. And he loves you this morning. If you're saved, you know you're saved. Are you walking with him? Are you where you should be? What's your prayer life like? What's your relationship with Jesus like? If it's not where it ought to be, you ought to take care of that this morning. With heads bowed, eyes closed, Sister Hope's coming to the piano. The altars are open. The front's open. You're welcome to get up out of your seat right now and join us down here in the front. We're going to have baby dedication here in just a minute. We're going to pray for some babies, but you've got time to come right now and, and, and get in this altar. Maybe you need to reevaluate your spiritual walk. Maybe you need to... Get saved this morning. Maybe there's somebody here this morning say, Pastor Shifflett, I'm not sure if I died right now that I would go to heaven. I hope I would go. I think I would go, but I don't know for sure if I died right now that I'd go to heaven. And I want you to pray for me. Would you be honest enough this morning, right where you're sitting, carefully and just quietly, would you slip your hand up so that I could see it, so that I could pray for you? Pastor Shifflett, I'm not sure if I died right now I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. Anybody anywhere? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I see that hand. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you.